Hello everyone, welcome back. Uh, this screencast is going to continue our discussion on lesson planning, except this time we're going to be focusing mainly on the main instruction. But before I get into it, I really want to focus on uh, giving you feedback about your uh, what you've done so far. You've um, started your backwards planning for your lesson plan. You began with your summative assessment, and then you did a task analysis to um, identify the necessary thinking skills associated with that assessment, and from that to uh, to list or identify um, some learning objectives and how to link that up with the formative assessment. One of the things that I'm seeing is that you guys are incredibly uh, um, knowledgeable about your content area and you're very excited about doing um, some really uh, exciting things in your classrooms and I applaud you uh, for doing it and I encourage you to do it. Um, but I also see that there's some opportunity for growth and I really want to focus on that just a little bit here and we'll talk about it more in class as well. Um, I want you to make sure there is alignment among everything in your lesson plan, almost everything. Specifically, make sure there is alignment among your summative assessment, your thinking skills, your formative assessment, and your learning objectives. You should be able to draw a clear connection between, uh, among all of these points. So what your summative assessment is, it matches your objectives, your thinking skills, and formative assessment. All of that should be uh, together and nicely aligned. The other thing that I really want to draw your attention to is this alignment between objectives and your formative assessment. So that's your daily lesson plan. So your daily lesson plan is going to list your objective and you should have a formative assessment at the end. And I'm a stickler for students being mindful of the connection between objectives, instruction, and assessment. Um, there is nothing worse than having a teacher teach about one thing in class but test on something else. And maybe you've been in a class where that has happened. Um, but it's so important that you are given the opportunity um, to align your objectives and your formative assessment. Make sure that those are together. Um, I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about assessments and two more assessments. Um, one is a normative assessment. Um, these are usually your SATs and GREs and the like. And the purpose of these tests is to measure or to see variance among all of the participants, all of the people taking the test. Um, so they like to see uh, some students get it right and some students get it wrong and and um, and you know they want to see that range um, what is typically called the bell curve they like to see that um, they're looking for wrong answers um, we don't want to be normative assessment makers we are not that's not our job to be normative assessment uh, makers where we look for variance among students. We actually want to be more um, like performance assessment makers where we uh, create an assessment where the expectation is that if we have done our job, if we as teachers have done our jobs well, then most if not all of our students have done well. We don't want to see variance. We want to see uniformity, that all of our students have had the opportunity to be successful. Um, so your assessment is as important as your instruction. Those two should work together, and you want to see students do well um, at the end of those. So, okay, enough of that. Let's turn our attention to the main instruction part of the lesson. And um, we know that we need to create opportunities for students to be engaged in those relevant thinking skills. Here are some things that I really, really want you to know. 
Um, first thing I want you to know is this idea, I've been saying it already, and it's this concept of opportunity to learn, OTL. This is a popular concept within education. You hear a lot of educators use this. The term focuses attention on, on, um, on teachers providing opportunities for students to actually be engaged in some way in the learning. Opportunities come in the form of time on task, resources available to students, providing feedback to students, and um, giving them space to do the activity, and giving them um, uh, enough time to practice the particular skill uh, in order to master it and perfect it. Um, so opportunity to learn suggests that we provide these opportunities um, or believe that by providing these opportunities, students will benefit and, um, and grow. It also suggests that, you know, our job is that all the best that we can do is to provide the opportunities uh, for students and that there is the unknown factor that is the student who can decide whether or not they want to participate or not. We just provide the opportunity. Hopefully the student will rise to the occasion and engage in these activities and, and learn from them if we are doing our job right. Um, but there are, there are students and there are probably times when students are choosing not to participate. They are resisting to participate. And um, of course that's another thing. But our primary job is to provide the opportunity in the hopes that students will um, choose to engage. Um, to provide the opportunity for students to engage, we can consider um, this idea of um, uh, students' uh, engagement um, in the task. How do we think about engagement? And we can think about it in terms of this uh, engagement to thinking ratio, or actually this participation to thinking ratio. So you have um, how are students participating in the class, and what kinds of thinking activities are they having to do in the class, or are they moving up to high order thinking, which I call hot um, in this. So we want to try to find opportunities for students to uh, um, to be engaged in high order thinking and to have an opportunity to participate. So this ratio can look like this. Isn't that cool? Colorful. All right, so um, I got this from a site called Match, M-A-T-C-H, ed, education, matcheducation.com. And, um, they have some really cool stuff. They uh, have created a number of charter schools, mainly on the East Coast, and they also have a teacher preparation program as well. And um, and what they are proposing, which I agree with, and um, we're going to learn more about the reasons behind it, is that we want to have, uh, we have two continuums. One is high order thinking versus low order thinking down here. So high order, low order, and high participation on this and low participation. So when you break this up, when you have these two lines, we're creating these quadrants, right? So there's four little squares. Um, and what we wanna try to do is try to put, um, uh, create our instruction so that it, it falls in one of these squares, actually these squares are not equal, that some are better than the other. So we have uh, the square of high order thinking and high participation, high order thinking and low participation, low order thinking and low participation, and low order thinking and high participation. Um, I'm going to leave this uh, first part of the screencast asking you the question, which of these quadrants do you think is best? And it's pretty easy, but think about it until you start the next one. Thanks.